there are going to be questions um, on uh, the chat, which I will also make sure that uh, they get answered. If they're not answered, we'll send it to you by the time that we finish. Uh, and, uh, and just uh, to bring, bring out everything that we have, we have Tom Tom about Peter in the office now. So Peter, no pressure, but uh, <laughs> they all know. So uh, Jerry was in the office uh, a month ago. Uh, and it was a pleasure to have him uh, too. And then so we, so uh, thanks Peter for coming. So first uh, let's start, how is, um, just to my colleagues, how is it uh, just from a personal perspective, uh, what does lockdown mean for you in the UK? And, uh, and we heard a lot of news of the UK and especially in, uh, in the European side. We have no idea what's going to happen in India. Um, yes, it's a lockdown, but we're not sure whether we are we, whether we'll peak. We will ever leap, ever peak at all, or we have peaked. So, from your perspective, Peter. Well, um, I, I, I was away uh, for my birthday last month in March, and I went to Spain, um, which proved to be a, a very unwise choice. So I arrived in Spain, and, and immediately uh, the country began to lock down. I, I flew out on the 12th of March, and the country began to close public institutions and keep people at home on the 13th. Um, so I had to escape Spain and I did so via a 13 hour coach trip to Lisbon oh. and, and I kind of flew back just as Portugal was going into lockdown and I arrived two days before the UK did and in those two days of getting back from my aborted holiday I um, obviously got the team kind of ready um, to respond. I, I'd already seen what was emerging elsewhere uh, in terms of the true extent of lockdown and assumed that the same would be taking place in Britain, even though our Prime Minister assured us that, that everything was under control. Um, we, we'd invested heavily in remote working and flexible working over the last few years, so we actually really adapted really well to this new reality. I've kept all my staff on. Um, this is a critical time for us. We're helping our members. We've got 3,000 social enterprise members, but we represent a community of 100,000 social businesses in the UK. So obviously adapting to the new reality that they're facing and trying to respond to their needs um, with practical uh, insights, support and help. Really, we segmented our community of social businesses into, into two stalls. There were those that were directly delivering public services and therefore were being overwhelmed by demand and challenges around staff and HR as more and more staff self-isolated and, and, and went home sick or displaying symptoms of COVID meaning right. that the services needed to bring in additional staff to, to maintain them and meet growing demand. And a lot of social enterprises are large in the UK. They're delivering frontline health and social care services. So this is really at the front line of COVID. Um, and quickly we recognised that the new resources were going to the state-run institutions rather than to the social businesses. So that was right. a, an initial problem. Secondly, the PPE, which has been a massive issue here in the UK, the personal protection equipment was all being prioritized for those in state employment without recognition that we had tens of thousands of frontline workers without PPE. Um, and so we've been heavily involved in trying to equip our social enterprise members with, with that frontline response and to ensure that they're safe and well and well equipped. Our other members have just kind of fallen off a cliff. Uh, all of their businesses have dried up, they've closed uh, either temporarily or permanently. Venues, community spaces, sports clubs, um, uh, leisure centres, uh, libraries, children's nurseries, uh, people selling consumer products like bottled water through hotels and restaurants. I mean, it's been devastating. Um, and our job really has been to ensure that they can connect with each other to find their own ways of peer support, uh, to provide them with the best uh, expertise to help them navigate through these times where possible through our corporate partnerships, government insight, lawyers, bankruptcy specialists, contract lawyers, procurement specialists, just about everyone you can imagine. Um, and then thirdly, of course, our main role has been to, to talk to government and ensure that the packages of relief, which the UK government have claimed, are worth £330 billion, pounds, are, are working well for social enterprises. And unfortunately, uh, with little surprise, they're not really. Um, the packages um, have not absolutely manifested in the way that they were announced. The business interruption loans are, are very, very slow to manifest. A lot of social enterprises have been missing out on, on other schemes and interventions because they're not mainstream traditional businesses with shareholders and 
So it's been research, collecting research on the state of the sector. It's been taking that to government. It's been campaigning and advocating to government. And then it's been also trying to respond to all of our members to help them get through this crisis. And then finally, of course, the most important bit is what does the world look like after this? How can we uh, make sense of this? And actually what we're using the hashtag of build back better. So how can we ensure that what comes out of this crisis is an economy that is fit for purpose and that is more equitable uh, more sustainable, uh, more inclusive and transparent, and to ensure that things like the business bailout funds are targeted around impact, uh, right. not just on the basis of, of a so assumed need. Right. And, and so, so is it, I mean, to, to question, is it fair, is it uh, because a crisis hit everybody so um, in, in like a tsunami, right? Is it slow because they're not able to grapple the crisis or it's slow because they're inefficient, because that's very critical for us to understand, in a sense, what else can we do in some of the states where it has not yet hit in India? Is it inefficiency or is it they don't understand or is it plain and double, they don't know how to handle a crisis? I mean, I, I do think, you know, I'm, I'm not a massive uh, enthusiast around government policy in this country uh, and haven't been for a while. However, a, a crisis of this magnitude um, that's so, so sweeping and all-encompassing uh, requires a speedy response. And a speedy and fast response isn't necessarily uh, consistent with a, a nuanced and thought through and detailed response. And so we've got these very big announcements and these very kind of big schemes um, that are quite blunt tools. And I think there is um, an inevitability uh, about, about the problems that are going to emerge when government tries to respond with 330 billion pounds of bailout, how that works its way through, the efficiency, the mechanisms it uses. It's been using the banks, it's only underwritten loans for businesses to 80%, which are, is making the banks very cautious about their exposure to 20%. And so you can imagine, um, you know, there is the will, but there isn't necessarily the the understanding of all of the systems, all of the mechanisms to get that money to flow, they're not all fully uh, worked out yet. And so there are problems, but there's an inevitability around that. The, 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 the thing for me really is around um, making sure that the funds are inclusive for all forms of business. And there is a nature when government responds quickly to just, you know, understand business as it traditionally does, which is the very traditional model of incorporated business. Um, and secondly, to actually make sure that it itself isn't in control of the emergency package. It needs to place funds out through the ecosystem that are right. best placed to understand the elements of that ecosystem with which it works. And there is a, a suspicion and a, a fear with government that these schemes are going to be abused, there's going to be fraud, the, trust, the sector can't be trusted. And actually, there's very little evidence that... But no, the suspicions are true. If, if, we, if we should probably distrust anyone, it, it, it's those in charge, you know, not not those within the system that are down. No, but do you think? Do you think after this uh, crisis or whenever the crisis is, there will be? I don't know what your views about the the positioning of. We all know what the position of social enterprises should be. But do you think people will still go back to the whole concept of too big to fail, big, fail because they are the guys who will create jobs while too valuable to fail can fail? So, so the question is, uh, is that going to be the push? I mean, is that the danger that you see that people will go towards the traditional businesses that they think will create jobs, not the social? Well, you know, it, it's, it's a very, very, it's a great question. And enthusiasts and optimists like you and I, Harish, um, can get carried away, I think, with the opportunities that these crises present and, and right. become a little bit uh, carried away, potentially, with what this means for the world and what this means for the future economy. And this could be a massive trigger for change. Right. I, I, do, I do really wonder, uh, actually, about how, how manifest that feeling is among citizens, how, how kind of sophisticated that understanding is about the... Uh, inequalities that have been exposed about the manifest failures and flaws of the system or whether people really are just focusing on, on wanting to get back to some sort of normality and, and reality. Um, and my fear is actually, the cynic in me, is that whilst we might see this as a great opportunity, 
we're probably not well placed to capitalize on it. And there is a very, very significant risk that, that things will, you know, kind of revert back to some level of normality. And it's up to us absolutely to ensure that that doesn't happen. And, and you know, with all of my commitment, uh, and I, you know, give that to you today, that's what absolutely I'm trying to do. I'm saying we cannot go back to the flawed system that existed before, that exposes inequality, insecurity, that rewards um, ir irresponsibility, um, and that is, you know, damaging not only our species, but the, the essence of the earth on which we all exist. And yet, I have to be realistic and say that we are fighting, you know, huge, huge vested interests. Um, if you look at who our governments are and, and who we are represented by at the moment, this does not feel like we have the same opportunity that we did coming out of the Second World War. If you look at the quality of leadership, you know, Putin, Trump, you know, Johnson across Eastern Europe, you know, we've got in Turkey, we've got the rise of the dictator in, in many respects. And I know that that's felt you know, across parts of Asia too. We should not take for granted that, that things are going to change as a consequence of COVID. We recognise that there is an opportunity to change things as a consequence of COVID, but it's not going to happen organically uh, or, and it's not going to happen without huge, huge effort. And, and, and uh, see now, because we are in like midway or whatever in terms of the lockdown, many of the NGOs and social, the civil society and, the, and, and especially the social enterprises are running out of money. So, the people saying that what I, I mean, <laughs> now the services of the social enterprises are going to go down, right? It's like, it's, I don't know how many people come to you for not only mentorship, but do you have financial resources? And like uh, thinking that you are the government of the UK in many ways. So how one is how you'll be able to handle it. Number two, the perception at the ground that NGOs should be helping, that people are not realizing that NGOs also are running out of extreme financial resources that they were supposed to and exactly all the monies have been diverted to the government what's what's the scenario in the uk with respect to that yeah it's a, a great question um and, and it's not been easy it feels like we've been involved in a bit of a battle uh, of wills um at first our influence um clearly was not there we, we are represented curiously partly as a consequence of brexit and all sorts of stuff represented by the department of culture media and sport within government and they came to us after a week of asking us for evidence, uh, the sense and, and such scale of impact on the sector. We came back to them and said we need a, at least a four billion pounds bailout for the next three months, which is modest compared to the 330 billion bailout that they've given to them, the mainstream economy. And they've said, like, no chance. Um, we have lost our department's ability uh, in terms of negotiation skills with our treasury. Um, they've come out with 750 million pounds. So 750 million pounds is a start. That's across the whole of the UK. Um, it, it doesn't even touch the sides of, of what's needed, um, but it is something. Um, and it wouldn't have come at all without, without pressure. But that's just round one, and, and we're going to need to continue to make the case to government for, for new and additional bailout funds and to press home the economic impact of decimating the sector, not only the social cost of doing so. We also need to talk to um, other influences, not just government. So the social investment community here have made available £100 million of interest-free loans for 12 months. Um, that, that should be um, um, much, much better suited to many social enterprises but again, isn't going to be anywhere near enough. Um, my current focus is on making sure that the mainstream schemes are, are actually fit for purpose for our members, so that rather than being excluded from those, you know, big interventions, that they can actually access support and help there. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, continue. Sorry. Continue, 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 continue. continue. The only other thing I was going to say was, is that, you know, I know that, that social enterprises are running out of cash, I also know how industrious and entrepreneurial they are. A lot of them have come into, into existence by you know, turning you know, rubbish into value. Um, and I don't doubt that although many of them will be devastated and it will take many years for them to come back, that actually less than I initially thought might actually make the decision to close down permanently. I think they'll scale back, they'll potentially put themselves into suspended animation for a few months. And when the market allows them to return, um, they will come back and they will, they will rebuild because you know, mission and purpose here 
um, you know, is far more pressing than ever before. And it's not as if we're going to allow something like a pandemic to stop us from that bigger mission and purpose right. to create social justice, uh, to create environmental sustainability and to create a better, fair economy that we all deserve. And so I, there will be devastation. Our job is to limit, limit the extent of that devastation but also to, to very much um, pr prepare for whatever future emerges. So if, 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 if I step back a bit before the crisis, uh, and then we'll come back to the present situation, Peter, is uh, was, uh, do your feeling was, while we, had a, we, we were getting the traction of what social enterprise meant for the world, et cetera, do you, had a do you have a feeling that it was getting hijacked uh, the definition of social impact, social impact, impact investments, social enterprise, was it getting injured? And in a, a, look at a silver lining of this crisis. Is that going to uh, thrash, uh, uh, it's going to weed out the bad guys always? Is, uh, that, that you can answer later, but the first was, was it getting hijacked? Was, were you fearing words? Was it getting diluted, et cetera? Do you, I mean, that's the, some of the push that all the monies were going towards Everybody talking about social impact and impact awareness. How are you dealing with it? I mean, you've been a pioneer in, in creating policies in the UK. How did you deal with it? Um, a bit kind of conflicted and compromised, uh, if I'm honest. And thank you. I don't deserve that amount of flattery. But, uh, and it's very rare coming from you, Harish, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> um, I'll tell you what. This is, this is the way I see it. Um, like... Social enterprise themselves are never going to be able to rise to the multiplicity and the scale of challenges we face. We have to allow contributions, um, genuine and sincere contributions from everywhere, the public and the private sector too. Has our agenda been hijacked? Has it been diluted? I think what we've done is create, to an element, to a degree at least, a movement. And that's attracted people in. And they are people with not necessarily consistent views with, with some of us that have been around for a very long time. But that's okay. We have to get over ourselves and we have to be an inclusive sector. Absolutely. And we have to bring people in and we have to win the arguments. And we have to win the arguments in public and openly and transparently. And we have to demonstrate that our, our theory of change, our way of working, the, the fundamental essence and value proposition of social enterprise isn't diluted and isn't lost in the mix. It is great to see more companies want to come in and play in the space of shared value. Um, but we also have to be guardians of what we've created and we have to call out and critique well-meaning, well-intended interventions that aren't just meeting, that aren't meeting enough the needs of our world and our society. So if we have people, you know, I saw like Ronnie Cohen, who I'm very fond of, the father of social investment, some call him, or the godfather of social investment, very wealthy man, very successful businessman. And he was saying, you know, we need um, um, like COVID prevention bonds. Um, uh, we need to market COVID prevention bonds. Um, it's the only way to scale mass testing. And we have to call it out and we just have to say, you know, creating new investment vehicles in in and of themselves are never going to tackle the fundamental root causes that we're trying to resolve here. They perpetuate them in some respects. So we have to call it out, but we shouldn't necessarily exclude or, 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 or marginalise those voices. We need to tackle them head on uh, in the same way that we have to tackle the policies of Trump head on. We, we, you know, we need to, um, to, to be you know, very compelling in, in what our goals are, what our theory of change is, and why the fundamental aspects of social enterprise, the fundamental you know, theory of change behind it cannot be lost or diluted in this process. And you know, we have to call out people that are fundamentally using our sector as another opportunity to, to maximize uh, returns and greenwash their own kind of legacies. Which country do you think has, ha, is far ahead? Or, or country or region that you think is far ahead in this thought process and has put in places to encourage the future set of social enterprises. Because today, I mean, what, I tell you, I have a question. Because every damn MBA school which was responsible for the creation of the so-called markets, the Wall Street, have created a sexy course as social enterprise and saying that it's, oh, you can make money while doing good. So, so is it, 
so there has to be some stricter policies that needs to be said how the money flows which which is your best example well scotland probably i'm social enterprise uk um we have um obviously four nations within the united kingdom currently things might change <laughs> Um, at, at the time of speaking, Scotland is still part of the UK, and I just think they understand they have an economic theory of change about how to address their social problems and make their contribution to issues like climate change. And they understand and they believe in the economic ideology behind social business. So they have a well developed ecosystem. Uh, social enterprise is prevalent throughout government thinking. I'm not saying it's by any means perfect, it's not, but it's really, really well developed. We're, we're beginning to see similar kind of you know belief in the sector in places like Canada um, and in New Zealand um, you know England wants a, a global leader in this space in terms of policy development has, has fallen behind I recognize that it's very sad but Scotland's advancing quickly um, lots of Africa so you know I, I develop and support the development of social enterprise networks in places like Ghana and Ethiopia and in Kenya and it's, it's alive, you know, and those economies are alive and those social entrepreneurs are emerging in huge numbers with great character, um, talent and skill. And so, you know, you shouldn't be looking to the UK, um, although Scotland is a great example. I think look to those emerging economies, particularly across Africa um, and some of those where they've got new leadership um, and new leadership is driving positive policy change and, and no better than New Zealand. Would that change? With the current crisis, would that change in well, implementation? I, 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 well, I, I think this is such a period of massive uncertainty. This changes right. everything, and I really do. And I, I don't think Trump is necessarily assured to, to, to get a second term if, if the COVID epidemic spreads, as I think it may well, across America. Um, you know, I, I, I don't even think my own government is as stable as it looks, even with a big majority in government and only being elected three months ago, because I think their response to COVID has been flawed. Um, I think there's going to be huge scrutiny, massive government intervention. So the old idea of kind of right wing political ideologies like you've got in India or we've got in the UK is all about small state. That rule book has been ripped up. You know, you've got a two trillion intervention in the US under Trump, a free marketeer, small government. You've got 330 billion, 350 billion coming from the UK government. I mean, this is mass state intervention. Some of it's socialism. Um, you know, I mean, this is extraordinary, uh, and the world is not going to be the same. And I think we have to uh, anticipate another period of mass instability and uncertainty. And there will be opportunities for good to come out of that. But you know, I, I remember back to my history books that taught me about the circumstances that led to the Great Depression of the 1930s, the impact that had on global trade, global economics, populism. And I am certainly very, very aware that, that you know, the road post COVID is not one of milk and honey. It is full of huge, huge risks uh, and we need to be aware of them and we have to mitigate them and we have to find ways of creating a compelling alternative narrative about a more hopeful uh, um, future. And the great thing that COVID has shown us here in the UK is the speed at which we can mobilize, the speed at which we can change and adapt. And if that tells us anything, it tells us that huge overwhelming issues like climate, climate change, in, inequality, and homelessness on our streets can be tackled quickly and swiftly where there is the motivation to do so. And so I'm hoping you know, the apathy and that cynicism that has plagued our society, um, it, it, you know, it, it is undermined and people do recognize that change is possible. And, and it, I mean, in the same, t I mean, I'm glad you, you brought this up, uh, Peter, is that, I mean, it's the same related to what Sarah has asked. We've been, I mean, it, we've been so much about phoenixes and phoenixes and too big. And now people should realize that democratization in the true fashion, decentralized businesses, decentralized processes, decentralized innovations are the way to go where you do not have this large scale displacement that is happening. And that, and that what will we do with the livelihoods with so many poor people who are going back to the rural areas, and especially in a country like ours? Do you, I mean, it's a question to Sarah's is, and, and Huda's, if you can tie in your question, it's like, you see a social enterprise pivot, is it a pivoting time? Is it an, what is an extent of a pro and a con? And based on your advocacy, do you see that we need to rename the so-called phoenixes or whatever somebody calls the zebras we need to get in the zebras and not the not the unicorns as we as we say like what, what, what do you think that is is it still 
dawning on people that the models were also wrong. Let's not blame the COVID crisis, but the models of economy was also wrong. Wow, there's some great questions coming up on the on the Q and A. I'll answer yours first, and then I'll, I'll work through the Q and A ones. And thank you for people for for sending them in. Um, yes, so there is the Financial Times, our, our much heralded pink newspaper um, um, that has been, you know, the ambassador and advocate for the city and big business for years and years and years, is calling out capitalism, calling for a kind of form of capitalism, more social value. Things have to change. Academics are there. I think, you know, professors of business at Oxford and Cambridge are, are joining this, along with very successful business leaders from the private sector, from the social sector. So there's definitely a recognition that, that capitalism either must adapt or die or be replaced with something else. And I think everyone recognizes that the most likely outcome and the most efficient outcome in resolving the challenges we face is through rapidly evolving it. Um, is government there? No. Government seems to be way behind on this, and that's partly because our government in the UK only has a five-year outlook before it needs to consider re-election, and that five-year horizon is incredibly limiting. It's all about how it can spend its period in government ensuring that it's well-placed or best-placed to be re-elected again, and that is not consistent with long-term value generation, long-term economic planning, but, you know, that's democracy and that's what we have to work with. So there is definitely a job to be done in ensuring that we can communicate this and the challenges, the complexity of what we're trying to communicate so that we can kind of bottle it and that, you know, our fellow citizens in all sorts of low paid jobs facing all sorts of struggles can understand that there is a different route through here. And I don't know whether we need the, the PR genius of the sorts of people that have been winning elections for Donald Trump and Boris Johnson, you know, three word slogans, how do you boil down, <laughs> you know, the vision we have for the future into, into three simple words. I mean, you know, answers on a postcard, please. Um, you know, build back better is one attempt, but it's, it's hard to, to land this stuff. Um, and traditionally the social sector hasn't been great at doing it, but we just have to continue to try and innovate and build and, and not lose uh, our belief that we can do it. Well, I'm just going to take some of the questions from the Q&A here uh, around philanthropic organisations. I mean, I think philanthropic organisations, again, I feel quite conflicted by them. You know, they are part and parcel of the system which has driven such you know, unequal distributions of wealth in the first place. So I don't always feel comfortable, you know, taking their money, uh, particularly when it comes uh, with, with so many uh, requirements and restrictions. But not all funders are the same. And there are some great trusted foundations out there that are on the journey with us. So, you know, I think you go to those that, that feel as if they are are with the current mood of economic social change um, and radical economic and social change and in those respects their money is incredibly valuable and scarce um, and so yeah i have no problem about going and getting it and trying to use it in the most effective way possible but ultimately you know the old system has failed us you know the reason why we're seeing such obvious uh, you know examples of the depths and the grotesque nature of inequality is because that's what the old system has created. And therefore, I think social enterprises need to look at new forms of, of raising capital, not just philanthropic forms. Uh, you know, community shares, crowdfunding are really, really being very successful here. Um, we've got a social enterprise, uh, so sewing um, and clothing and, and you know, manufacturing uh, social business. Um, it's completely repurposed itself to do uh, personal protective equipment for COVID outbreak. Uh, it's, it's raising its investment in order to pivot in that direction from crowdfunding because it's much, much faster than going down those traditional philanthropic routes. So like any entrepreneur, you know, you get money where you can, you know, you, you go down the philanthropic routes if it works for you, but there are other routes uh, available too. And some of those are much, much more efficient and effective. Um, Will it be possible, uh, the threat and the challenges for a social entrepreneur post-COVID? Well, us social entrepreneurs, and I'm sure you, you feel the same way, Harish, nothing so good as a, a crisis to create opportunity. Yeah. And we are seeing social enterprises, those that can, 
pivot and respond and find opportunity here. We're trying to do that as a think tank and campaigning organization. How can we attach social enterprise relevance to COVID? Our members are now making stuff or delivering stuff directly to people's homes or encouraging people to pay it forward. So buy stock from them, but pay in advance to ease their cash flow. There's a, a million ideas emerging from the social enterprise community. And the great thing about being entrepreneurial, whether that's you or your team or your organization, is that you can start immediately thinking about how you can turn this disaster into an opportunity and one that actually contributes back to society as well. So, you know, you know, don't be down. Yes, it's tough. It's tough for us all, but there's, there's things that there's things uh, out there that can be done. Um, Two questions. What is ideal? And then, um, well, look, I mean, I, you know, I, I am equally as cynical about the whole impact driven economy uh, as you parish, but ultimately that's what we need, isn't it? We need to make all economic decisions, particularly those large ones taken by governments and large corporations to be transparently taken through a lens of economic, social and environmental impact. And so my vision of a post COVID uh, economy would be one that is much, much more transparent, where poor practice and irresponsibility isn't hidden in, um, you know, tax havens in the British Virgin Islands and, you know, British government mere culpa, completely responsible for much of that. I'd also like to see, um, you know, public legislation passed throughout governments around the world that say that when we bail out business, when we make big economic interventions, they are done so transparently through an impact lens of social impact, environmental impact and economic impact. The idea that companies like Virgin Atlantic buried overseas in tax havens are now uh, accessing favourable loans and bailout monies, uh, I think is, 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 is intolerable now to, to not just me, but to growing swathes of the country. And therefore I do think that public mood will affect public policy, but I also recognize how swiftly things went back to business as usual um, in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. Right. So, you know, I am, I'm, I retain optimism because if not, I, I, it would kill my enthusiasm for my job. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> But I'm, you know, desperately cynical uh, uh, as well of, of, of the battles ahead to, to deliver that economy. And I get your point, Kunal. It's a great, great point. Um, you know, not only the impact of COVID is most felt by the most vulnerable in society. Um, absolutely, we've seen that here in the UK. You'll see it right around the world. Everyone says we're in it together. Frankly, we're not. Um, you know, the poor, the vulnerable, those people delivering public services whether that's transport or health, uh, keeping our retail, our petrol stations open, our poor pay, on the whole in the UK, more likely to be from a minority background too, um, and much more susceptible to, to, to capturing COVID. The likelihood is that the recovery will also protect and benefit those that are already privileged. Um, and you're right. Um, you know, I do think, you know, the, the words of Mohammed Yunus and all the times I've, I've chatted to him ringing my ear here, you know, you, you shouldn't expect um, anyone to rush to your aid, um, even though morally you, you might think that that should be the case. We have to find ways to capitalize ourselves, even in uh, underserved communities. Capital does flow, money does exist, opportunities exist to, 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 to collaborate, to cooperate, and to build power and to build small amounts of capital, which can then be used to, to further develop yourselves. A great example, of course, is uh, Mondragon in the Basque uh, area of Spain. They've driven their own local economy um, for you know, 30, 40, 50 years now. Um, and what an economy and what a society it is as a consequence. So we have to take hope. Um, we shouldn't assume the system and the power and the wealth is gonna flow to poor communities anytime soon, I'm afraid. So before you take the next question, uh, uh, I just wanted to, um, uh, Elena, can you ask your question physically on video? Hello, yeah, there it is. Ah. <laughs> on the S. You're muted, Elena. 
Sorry. I'm sorry. Hi. Hi, Eleanor. It was uh, so good to hear from you, Peter, and uh, being again with uh, the Silco family. Um, you know, we are in this uh, terrible um, storm uh, altogether. And uh, as an uh, impact investor, I'm, uh, uh, we are really thinking what we should do. And uh, of course, we have a big fund, uh, probably will be ready in a couple of months. But uh, now we are thinking about uh, some relief and emergency fund. And we are thinking about recoverable grants. I don't know whether it is used, it has been used, it has been successful, it can be successful. So I'm just wondering to you and to Arish as well, um, what do you think? Do you think it might be good to really to, to go through this journey and try to set up a, a fund providing recoverable grants? So maybe we will lose the money, maybe some will recover, but uh, so I'm just wondering. Uh, that's a great question, Eleanor, and it is lovely to see you. And my love and my uh, empathy go to you and everyone in particularly Northern Italy who have gone through just the most unimaginable uh, consequences of this crisis. Um, can I just also say the spirit um, with which I've seen um, Italians respond has been really moving. Right, I've composed myself. It's been very moving to see the, 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 the communitarian response from so many people in Italy. It really has been uh, inspiring. Right, very deeply. Uh, soft loans, we call them. Recoverable grants. Uh, I like the idea and we have used them here. I think that there's, um, you know, so much of a rush to create a sustainable, commercialised social investment market without recognising that kind of middle ground at a time of so much economic uncertainty, we can't really assume that businesses can take on, um, you know, contractual debts and, and uh, loans without that certainty that they'll ever be able to, you know, repay them back. We're asking people to, to make decisions which they know could ultimately suffocate them further down the line. So I think there's never been a better time for this model. And I think the way that we see it, recoverable grants um, or soft loans, is that they are taken through a loan process. Um, you know, the, the ability to repay the loan is assessed, but recognizing that should the business um, become uh, or find itself in a position where it isn't able to retain those payments, then rather than the, the, the loan being pursued through, you know, directors' um, assets or, or other means, that the, the loan is converted into a grant. And of course, that is a last step. But what it does do is give people running social enterprises the, the faith that if they do everything that they can and they use the money as wisely as possible and try and maintain their businesses, should something happen, it, it doesn't mean catastrophe. And I think that that is uh, the very, very best way that the social investment and impact investment community can, can respond right now. I also recognise that investors don't want to lose their money and, and some will say, hang on, what happens if all of these businesses just say, sorry, we can't repay? And I think that's where we can look at ways of kind of maybe underpinning or providing some security against those loans through government schemes or through other uh, endowed foundations uh, and other approaches. So I think there are ways to, to kind of mitigate the, the needs and the risks for both sides. But in principle, recoverable grants, uh, and we use the term soft loans, are absolutely the right approach. And of course, you would be at the forefront of thinking about what the enterprise needs, rather than thinking about how the investor can protect their assets at all costs. And that, Eleanor, is why Harish and I love you as much as we do. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, I Eleanor. Like you, you know. Thanks, I Thank know. We'll try to do our best, we'll try to do. No, so, I mean, it's, it's the same issue. I mean, uh, what people don't realize, and especially coming from an Indian, Indian point of view, Elena and, and uh, Peter, is that taking the analogy of a, of a say, a sub, of a health sector analogy, a, a sub-center, uh, a public health center, and then the district hospital. If the sub-center and the public health center collapses, 
that means there's a lot of strain on the public on the district hospital that increases the transaction cost of the poor to reach that district hospital and the district hospital will not be able to cater to the services and that's exactly the point if the small enterprises in the rural areas and will all collapse then you are also going to go at the big guys to help the transaction cost of the poor to get those services with its education livelihoods are going to increase this guy might become fat and fat but the portion is you have created the transaction cost so it's so critical for us to make sure that these guys that is equivalent to a sub center that is the smes should not collapse because then you are you're not only it's it's a loss of livelihood for that particular enterprise but the greater damage is the loss of services to the end users on a large scale that's going to happen in the future and that's critical elena is that the th thought process that you're doing is to have those relief funds and how does it actually reach to that guy so it doesn't get swallowed in the middle by the same uh, uh, same that the same uh, people who have hijacked some of the social impact space uh, today is is but it's very very critical uh, uh, peter sorry the, the point i wanted to, to make actually is this i mean we we haven't prioritized um, influence and engagement with the social investment community we recognize that there is a job that they can fulfill but they themselves do not have the capital or the capability to meet the sector need right now. So we need government intervention. And I'm very clear about that. I welcome everything that the social investment community can do, but this requires significant government intervention right around the world. And I don't want to kind of um, absolve government of its own responsibility by putting too much expectation on the social investment community. This has to be driven by government. You're absolutely you know, right. And what we need to do is, is press home the case that there is an economic and social and environmental benefit of government bailing out our sector, even though we might you know, represent uh, 100,000 different organisations rather than the traditional sort of big business with which they engage. I'll, I'll tell you one example of this. So the government have provided £750 million pounds for 100,000 social enterprises and 180,000 charities to access. In the same week, they provided 550 million pounds of bailout to one large supermarket. That large supermarket, the week before receiving 550 million pounds of government bailout money, distributed 650 million pounds out through dividends to its shareholders. Now, you know, this is just extraordinary. Right? This is nothing like the impact economy that we desperately need to see. So our job is to take these stories to the press to help create public outrage so that we can uh, exert public pressure for the government to recognise its own unsophisticated, unwise and unreconstructed approach to, uh, to bailing out business and to supporting the economy. So to... to, to... Peter and to Elena from an Italian perspective, uh, this is um, uh, uh, Gunajit's question here on Q. There's a biased attention. I don't know whether it's a biased attention, Gunajit, on the immediate health em emergency because it, the, the attention has to be on health emergency, but not so much on the other sustainable goals. Um, would there be a catching up? Would there be a race after that? And by the time are we racing, would the monies would have dried out? Do you, do you see a danger in both the country? Not a, I mean, I don't know how to say it. It's not a, yes, if we were in those positions, we will prioritize health. So we will we'll throw everything at health right now. Do you see that there will be a little bit of time? Yeah, sorry. Elena, do you want to go first? Peter, you go. Okay, so, I mean, look, of course health is going to be prioritized it's the most pressing and burning issue right but you know health doesn't just manifest itself in covid the, the economic depression that we're about to enter is likely to create many many more casualties than the actual virus itself same with climate change so what we need to do is when we are required to make these big interventions and they come frequently with increasing frequency certainly is we still need to take them through the lens of the SDGs. We still need to recognize that even if we are prioritizing health right now, we can still do so in a way that complements and furthers our advancement of the other SDGs. So for example, Harish, 
Now, what this has exposed is the very, very low pay, the job insecurity of people that are actually doing the most valuable work in society. The care of our elders and most vulnerable are the lowest paid, are given the worst working conditions um, and, and the worst kind of contractual uh, working environments to work in. What do we value? I mean, you know, so yes, let's prioritise health, but let's reframe our health ecosystem, our health systems and structures so that they are better placed in the process to contribute towards those other agendas. Like we are burning through a billion pieces of disposable PPE a week in this country. Who knows how much you're getting through in India? This is all landfill, this is all being burned. Look, I know there was a crisis on, but we cannot forget our other responsibilities to the planet. We have to think through sustainable health interventions, not just the immediate pressing priorities. So we've got members now, social enterprise members, that are saying, like, hang on, this disposable use of uh, disposable PPE masks, gloves made in factories in China where working conditions are poor, where there's no health and safety, uh, you know, is, is in itself unacceptable. How can we make sustainable, reusable PPE that does the job efficiently and effectively, that creates employment, that helps begin to recover and rebuild our economies in, in a smart way? Every crisis brings its opportunity. The COVID one does. My fear is we're not just grasping it or not ensuring that our response is sophisticated or, or well thought through enough. Thanks, Peter. I don't know. Thanks, Peter. I, yeah. I, I echo the worries uh, coming from Peter um, because we have already seen here um, many ways it's uh, um, like we built a COVID hospital in Milan, like 25 million and now we don't have, a, we have just 10 people there. Sorry. And um, um, as you know, we write on the, the new, now they say that we need one billion face mask a month, every month. Uh, so the, 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 the problem is that uh, obviously we have, um, we have a face and we are facing this huge health emergency, but the problem are very much many others. And uh, uh, the, the, the challenge is that uh, while leaving this emergency, we are not able really to address everything is coming around this uh, health intervention as well. Because, uh, you know, can you imagine one billion mask, face mask thrown away because they are not, they, 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 in the wrong way, every month, just in Italy. So um, I, I think that we should prioritize also the economic risk construction. And uh, uh, that is what we are trying to, to, to do. But... Uh, It's a, also an election power for the government. It's, a, it's, a very, it's a very easy to say that you, you, you save the life of so many and that you were so good. And, you, and so it's, a, it's definitely a challenge. Thanks, Elena. I, I also, uh, thanks, Elena and Peter, for that. Uh, can I also uh, ask if they could mute uh, Shoro uh, Mukherjee? Uh, Shoro uh, Mukherjee is a well-known uh, professor in uh, Indian Institute of Management in India who teaches social entrepreneurship. I hope he's online. Um, just to, just to also, what would we tell before he comes online? What would we tell to the future kids who are just graduating MBAs and boss? and who are like star-eyed, I've got to join the big four, the PricewaterCooper, et cetera, et cetera. What would you, what would we say to them that how do we, how, now we have to motivate because we, by 2025, by 2030, we need a new set of entrepreneurs and thinkers in the enterprise space. What would you advise them, both of you, Peter and Elena? And oh, Shorov, I want you to come in. I don't know where, why, is he sleeping? I'm not sure. Let's see. Okay. I mean, first of all, I'd, I'd respond to that question by saying um, that, that I would start by apologising to them for the, the state of the world in which they have entered into. Um, and secondly, I would say, um, but it really wasn't my fault. It was my parents' generation. 
I've actually been working really, really hard to tackle this shit. And it's, it's an incredibly difficult job. Uh, and we need many more hands to the deck. So I, I would make this point to any young person, you know, if, if COVID, if the economic crisis, if issues like migration don't demonstrate how interconnected the world is and how challenged the world is, then I'm not sure what, what learning you take from those crises. There is an imperative on everybody now to, to make a contribution. This cannot be left to NGOs or to governments. This is something, this burden of responsibility falls upon us all. Uh, and we have to start making that part of the kind of social contract between citizens um, and, and their fellow citizens and the social structures and public structures that exist amongst us. And that doesn't just apply to citizens, that absolutely applies to business. And so we need to, to you know, a post-Second World War kind of economic conversation about how do we collectively resolve these pressing issues in a way that, that doesn't um, diminish um, unfairly any of us. Um, you know, I think we need leaders to step up after COVID to do a kind of a Bretton Woods version too. My fear is if you look at the global leaders we've got, that's very unlikely to happen right now. Elena, and before I ask Shaurav to comment and ask any of those. Elena. Uh, you're muted, Elena. Elena, you, okay. So uh, I don't know whether she's. Uh, uh, Hello. Well, well uh, you know what I would tell. Hear me? Oh, no, no. Yes, please. Now? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, no, uh, um, I, 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 what can I tell to them? Uh, first, to, to look at uh, what you, Selko, and Peter, and the social enterprise they do right now and they've done so far. So just to look at the bright examples our generation has and uh, to do better and to keep doing and to, to really um, look at your legacy and uh, build on, uh, on that. That is um, the message I would really deliver to the new graduates. Thanks, thanks, Elena. Just to give a background, Saurav, uh, you're on. Uh, just to Elena and, uh, and to Peter, Saurav is a, is a dean, used to be the dean of uh, the Institute of Management in, in, in Bangalore, uh, in India, and then he's now, uh, he, I mean, he's a professor. His uh, claim to fame is that he was also the roommate for, to uh, the, one of the, uh, the roommates to uh, the head of Google, uh, which is the biggest uh, 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 social enterprise. <laughs> No, no, just joking. Sort of, what do you, uh, any questions to two of the eminent panelists, sir? Um, uh. No, I, I, I would like to answer the question that you have raised because I have about what should be the message when the students come back uh, to campus, even if not physically, uh, because we obviously are facing that uncertainty about when to bring them physically and, and, and so on and so forth. And this is not the time to get into that. Uh, and my sin thing is that, see, we are in a, in a situation of crisis now. And, and it's like we are fighting the war. We are fighting the battle on a regular basis. And at this point of time, maybe we will, you know, we will have to react more than, uh, than thinking very long term. And so I don't know whether there will be lessons about crisis management, about how we, even during the time of crisis, uh, we first thought about ourselves, right? I mean, if you look at the whole Indian response to the crisis, uh, you know, it's about how we can save our skins first, our backsides first, and, and not really thinking about how this lockdown would adversely impact the millions of migrants. And as we have been insisting right through the talk, uh, that how it disproportionately always uh, impacts negatively to the to the to the people who are most vulnerable in the society and then hopefully there will be a second part where things will settle down will that be a new world order i i really am not so such an optimist 
uh, I have seen people going back to business as usual post crisis. Mm, so, but hoping that there is a new world, I think that is the time when it, it is necessary to, to derive some of the lessons and, and see that had we been a little different in our thought process, had we been much more receptive to a lot of, uh, you know, the, the, the warnings that were being raised about capitalism, about narrowly focusing on personal gains and about widening inequity in this world, would we have responded better? Right, but at this point of time, so so my sense is a lot depends on who emerges as the ideals, the role models, after things settle down, and it's a very unpredictable world. Uh, it's highly possible that the Donald Trumps of this world will still manage to emerge as heroes after things settle down, and and that will be a very difficult scenario at that point of time to convince people that you know what. Uh, this is the the capitalist model is is not the correct model because you know this whole thing about if you can sufficiently tell something which is untrue if you can manage to put the blame on somebody else then you can always get away i mean and that's something that we have been always fighting and there is the worst case scenario is this will get reinforced uh, as we move along the crisis so at this point of time i'm just hoping that we we kind of settle down to a slightly different what they call the new normal after the crisis settles down. And that can be a big lesson for someone who comes to a business school or a management institution to, to have a greater view or, or a better view of the world. Thanks, uh, uh, Peter. I'm just gonna say, um, you know, kind of furthering really on, on my initial reflection on what I would tell students uh, today. I think one of the great losses we've seen through education is, is the joy of learning itself. I think more and more students are deemed to be kind of economic units that are trying to find ways to maximize their own, you know, kind of economic value. Um, I would love to see all students actually go through at least one semester uh, or term of philosophy, asking fundamental questions that I don't think we ask ourselves anymore. What is our value? How do we create purpose in our lives? You know, what are the fundamental tools to live a fulfilling, happy and content life. And there is so much emphasis on economic value to achieve that. And yet we recognize, of course, that there is no correlation between wealth, income wealth um, and happiness. So I would love to see students, you know, not just tra traverse through education as economic units seeking to generate their own maximum return, but also to see students I'd be given the space and the opportunity to explore actually what matters uh, in the world in which they are going to exist. Thanks, Peter. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have two minutes left, Peter and Elena. Last words, how do you, what's the next month look like? Um, and uh, in, it's in, on, a, on a note that is positive, where do you think on May 1st? I'm not sure when we will meet all of us uh, I'm sure, and uh, is the question is what what holds positively for the next two worlds and i have 84 of my colleagues um online what would you tell peter okay well be very very brief i saw another question from an anonymous person in chat about democracy and i just want to say that you know democracy doesn't start and end with government but the very nature of social enterprise is about furthering democratic opportunities for people to participate and contribute so just remember that, that aspect in the social economy. What's the next month hold? Um, I, I, who knows, right? I mean, I, I just cannot imagine um, what the next four weeks will hold. I suspect we won't have a clear sense of economic recovery. A lot of the hedge funds and economic analysts have been suggesting it's gonna be like a, a V-shaped recession. I think recovery is gonna be slow. Getting back to normal, using cafes, restaurants, cinemas, gigs, concerts is gonna take months, if not years. The only hope on the horizon, I know that two of the universities in the UK are now doing live testing human trials for vaccine um, and, and that might provide some economic stability. The next month for me is just supporting as many, many businesses as possible and being as creative as possible to protect them from this, you know, immediate short term threat. Elena, before I, uh, Peter, I have uh, one more thing before Elena comes. Um, I just want you guys to end with one personal question to each other. 
Well, Eleanor, I was going to come and see you in June and be with you in Venice. When will I see you again? Um, you know, that's that's it. We'll meet again. We'll meet again, and uh, you know, I will meet. I, I'm missing you. And um, a, a question to Peter. A question to Rich. A question to everybody. I mean, uh, is uh, uh, we should uh, try. How we should work it together more and better. This is a, a really a, a call for cooperation, for collaboration. We, we need to try to, to change and to make sure that uh, we really not go back uh, to the usual business and to the usual uh, world order. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree, Harish, with that. I think there is no better time in history than for us to convene and come together and actually present a, 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 you know, a universal vision that is adopted by organizations right across the world of how the future can be. Because I think that's where we are missing a trick. I think people assume that there is inevitability about our direction of travel and we have to paint an alternative future of hope, of equity, uh, of justice at its heart and motivate and inspire people by that. And I know it's not easy, but people have done that before and we need to do that again. No, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Elena. I think it is all our collective responsibilities also to um, to 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 inspire students, uh, students of whether it's Shorov or anybody else. How do we get the next set of Jerry's, next set of Peters, and next set of Elenas uh, for this world to to relook at it and in a manner that is uh, holistic, inclusive, and we don't have to look at the use and throw model that the poor can only be used for their physical labor and they have nothing else. And I think it's high time we stopped thinking. Um, and even non-exclusive thinking is racist thinking. And I hope people understand it's, it's not racism, it's just not about color and religion, but it's also about the way we think about other people. So thank you so much, Peter, Elena, Shorov. I see Karthik, Jyotsanaji, everybody online. Um, Yolanda was there. Um, Philip, I'm so glad. Philip so from Arida, I guess, has joined in. Thanks so much for everybody and uh, great pleasure to have both of you. It's an honor to listen to you and hopefully we meet soon and hopefully it's Bangalore. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, it's been lovely to see you too and I wish everyone at Selco well over these difficult times. I of course wish Eleanor well, but uh, I'm thinking of you all at Selco. There are very few uh, social enterprises that I come across that inspire me as much as Selco and the work that you and your team do and have done is absolutely uh, the motivation that I need to keep on going right now. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for those words. I mean, it's always, again, a praise from you is difficult to hear. So. Well, you've been uncharacteristically kind and flattering today, Harish, so I thought I'd repay the compliment. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.